Good afternoon. Uh, our numbers are dwindling. Avenue, thank you for sticking around. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> the Polish peasant in Europe and America is a classic of interwar sociology. One of its signal contributions and a key reason for its classic status is the social disorganization paradigm. In the United States, the Chicago School of Sociology applied this paradigm to interpret a range of urban social problems in the 1920s and early 1930s, and it remains uh, influential on in some corners of American sociology today. The rules of behavior and the actions viewed as conforming or not conforming with these rules constitute social institutions, Thomas and Zanetsky wrote. And the totality of institutions found in a concrete social group constitutes the social organization of this group. Thomas defined primary groups as those societies which, through kinship, isolation, or voluntary adhesion to certain systems of definitions, secure an emotional unanimity among their members. The first and second volumes of the Polish Peasant examined the organization of the peasant primary groups, namely family and community, and in the words of the authors, the partial evolution of this system of organization under the influence of the new industrial system and of immigration to America and Germany. As these remarks indicate, Thomas and Manetsky viewed capitalist development and migration as the major disorganizing influences upon the Polish peasants' primary groups. Social disorganization, they wrote, refers to a decrease of the influence of existing social rules of behavior upon individual members of the group. The status of the community is thus indicated by whether there are common rules and how well they are observed. The third volume of the Polish Peasant used the autobiography of a migrant to illustrate the related but separate phenomenon of personal disorganization, while the fifth volume focused on the social disorganization experienced by the Polish immigrant in America. For Thomas and Znamiecki, social disorganization was at least potentially a transitional phenomenon that could be followed by the eventual reintegration of individuals into a new social order. This process, they pointed out, did not, quote, consist in a mere reinforcement of the decaying organization, but in a production of new schemes of behavior and new institutions better adapted to the changed demands of the group, unquote. Borrowing a term from American pragmatism, they called this process social reconstruction. Reconstruction entailed rational and voluntary cooperation in place of coercion, active and intelligent solidarity rather than unthinking conformity, and instead of the suppression of individualistic attitudes, their redirection toward common and socially useful purposes. Highlighting this possibility, the fourth volume of the Polish peasant treated the dissolution of the primary group and the social and political reorganization and unification of peasant communities in Poland on the new ground of rational cooperation. My paper seeks to ground the categories of the social disorganization paradigm historically. What is the historical basis on which this paradigm rests? As sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has pointed out, theoretical dualisms often rest on historical oppositions. For example, he wrote, we could show that the historical opposition between France and Germany has served as a basis, unconscious and repressed, for the grand alternatives of civilization and culture. As I've shown, as I've shown in my recently published monograph, Modernity and the Jews in Western Social Thought, these categories were also based upon the historical opposition between Deutschtum and Judentum. Likewise, this paper shows how Thomas and Znanietsky invoked real or purported differences between Poles and Jews to elucidate the social disorganization paradigm. The contrasts that they made between Poles and Jews constitute an important historical basis, albeit unconscious and repressed, for the theoretical categories of primary group organization, social disorganization, and social reorganization or reconstruction. Now, to support this argument, I'll contrast the published peasant to Old World Traits Transplanted, a book that Martin mentioned this morning, a book published in 1821 and largely written by William Thomas, 
though credited to the American sociologist Robert Park because of the scandalous circumstances under which Thomas was dismissed from the University of Chicago. Now recall that it was not only migration, but also capitalist development that disorganized the Polish peasant. It was in connection with the latter that Thomas and Zbietzky described the Jews in Poland as a major source of disorganization. Standing outside of Polish social life and Polish society, they wrote, the Jews were to a large extent representatives of the capitalistic economy. As such, they introduced the peasant to a new, alien, and individualistic ethos of economic rationalism at odds with, quote, the old family economy in which economic values are still to a large extent qualitative, not yet subordinated to the idea of quantity. And the dominant attitude is the interest in getting a good living, not the tendency to get rich, unquote. Indeed, they argued much deeper than the social disorganization produced by the Polish peasants' own migration was, quote, the disorganization produced by strangers, such as the Jewish shopkeeper, who settled among the local inhabitants, bringing with them different mores, but failed to become assimilated in the case of Jews through racial reasons, unquote. Moreover, Thomas and Zanietzky argued that Jews as social carriers of economic individualism were not only disorganizers of the peasants' primary groups, they also competed with the cooperative institutions that Thomas and Zanietzky saw as the basis for the reorganization of peasant life in Poland. In addition to associating Jews with economic individualism, Thomas and Zanietzky also associated them with crime and deviance. Quote, the Jewish shopkeeper in a peasant village, they wrote, is usually also a liquor dealer without a license, a banker lending money at usury, often also a receiver of stolen goods, and near the border, a contrabandist. We have seen in the documents, and they are referring to Polish newspapers published between 1892 and 1913, the methods by which the shopkeeper teaches the peasant boy smoking, drinking, and finally stealing. This negative view of Jews dovetailed with the traditional prejudices of the Polish noble and gentry classes who found it useful to blame Jews for the poverty and drunkenness of peasants. As historian David Vitale points out, Jews were historically no more than lessors of the nobility's established monopoly of the right to distill alcohol and trade in it. And there was no reason to suppose that if the Jews were eliminated from the chain, others would not take their place. But these aspects of the problem were typically ignored. The Jews, whom Thomas and Znanietzky saw as disorganizers of others in the old world, came to exemplify uh, something different in the new world. They came to exemplify the potential for creative reorganization there. Although Thomas never completed and published his intended study of the Jews in Europe and America, old world traits transplanted provide some indication of the analysis he was developing in collaboration with Robert Park and Herbert Miller. Commissioned for the Carnegie Corporation's Americanization Studies Project, the study identified the Italians, the Poles, and the Jews as the three largest groups of new immigrants in America. They were roughly equal in numbers, each comprising 3 to 3.3 billion members at the time of the book's publication in 1921. However, the author suggested the three groups epitomized different stages in the transition of immigrants to America's urban civilization. The Italians were identified with the stage of primary group organization at the beginning of the transition. They retained its advantages longer than many other nationalities, their family and community life was affectionate and intimate, and its bonds were generally strong enough to prevent the demoralization of the second generation, which characterizes the Poles and to some extent the Jews. Those are their words. The Poles were seen to exemplify more than the other two immigrant groups the transitional crisis phase of social disorganization. The Polish communities in America, they said, failed to provide various types of organizations which would assist their members in adjusting themselves to the complex American life. They neglected their demoralized members, instead abandoning them to American charity organizations, legal aid societies, and juvenile courts. But otherwise, the Polish immigrants showed, quote, little tendency to participate in American life and institutions, unquote. 
This characterization dovetailed with the assessment that Thomas and Zanetsky had previously made in the Polish peasant, which noted that, quote, as compared, for instance, with the Jewish charitable institutions, the Poles in America have little to show in this line, end quote. Uh, yesterday, uh, Dorota suggested that they may have overstated the degree of disorganization uh, in the United States. That, that may well be true. But at least in old world traits transplanted, uh, they describe Poles in this way as exemplifying uh, this phase of the social disorganization paradigm. Lastly, the Jews were said to exemplify the third phase of reconstruction. Quote, the Jews, far more than any other immigrant group, are resorting to reflective social activity and supplementing the old social forms which had been spontaneously reproduced with new conscious organizations, unquote. What was their evidence of this? Thomas Park and Miller pointed to the Jewish Kehila of New York, an experimental attempt from 1909 to 1922 to provide the city's burgeoning Jewish population with a unified and democratic community structure as the prime example of this reflective social activity. The Kehila was formed in reaction to a public allegation made in 1908, later retracted, by New York City Police Commissioner Theodore Bingham that half of the city's criminals were Jews, a sign of perceived social disorganization that troubled Jewish notables. For the first time, the Kehila provided a permanent institutional basis for cooperation between the city's affluent, assimilated, uptown German Jews and its poor Eastern European, Yiddish-speaking downtown Jews. More concretely, it sought to organize philanthropic and religious affairs, improve Jewish education, mediate labor disputes between Jewish workers and Jewish employers, and reduce Jewish crime. Furthermore, the Jews were distinguished in old world traits transplanted, not only by their progress in social reorganization, but also by the fact that it was largely their own accomplishment, in contrast to the Polish peasant, whose reorganization in Poland was said to be mainly led from above and by outsiders, namely the Polish upper strata. Alongside the New York Kehila, Thomas saw the city's Yiddish press as another promising sign of creative social reorganization. Thomas was especially interested in the forwards, the largest of New York's four major Yiddish dailies in terms of circulation, and its dental brief, or a pack of letters section, in which the editors provided information, advice, and help in response to readers' letters, which describes typical problems that immigrants or their children experienced adjusting to the new world. As Thomas saw it, the dental brief provided individuals with definitions of situations and mobilized public opinion to enforce them. In this way, the Yiddish press operated as a new instrument of social control, and we should be careful about that term. Uh, by this, Thomas meant simply the capacity of a group to regulate itself according to its desired principles and values. Social control, in this sense, was not a product of ordering and forbidding, but instead required the conscious reflection and active participation of individuals in the community. It depended, as the pragmatist philosopher George Herbert Mead put it, on the ability of individuals to assume attitudes of others who are involved with them in common endeavors. In this instance, the editor, as an enforcer of desirable standards of family and community interaction, operated with the aid and consent of public opinion and participation. The Yiddish press was a means not only for the self-regulation of the community, uh, but also for its expansion. In his 1922 book, The Immigrant Press and Its Control, Robert Park suggested this was true in two ways. The immigrant press fostered a sense of racial and national solidarity among its readers at the expense of narrower and more provincial forms of identification. <laughs> at the same time, the American public was, quote, beginning to take notice of the foreign language papers, unquote, and to discuss, end quote, the opinions expressed therein. Quote, if immigrant editors and readers know that their paper is read outside its own language group, that America is interested in what it says and takes account of its opinions, that very fact establishes a measure of control, unquote. By this, Park did not mean Anglo-American control over immigrants. Rather, he envisioned immigrants and native-born Americans becoming members of the same wider public through which they could communicate and collaborate 
the purpose of regulating the common affairs. According to Thomas Park and Miller, immigrant institutions like the Jewish Kehiva and the Yiddish press were not an, an expression of separatism, but rather an effort to participate in American life. In this respect, too, Jewish experiences in Europe and America were studied in contrasts. On the one hand, as Thomas and Zmanietzky recognized, Jews were, in significant respects, excluded from the wider national community being, re, uh, being organized in newly independent Poland. They described Jews as the most unassimilable of races. They repeatedly noted the strong connection that Poles made between Polish nationality and Catholicism, and they noted that Poland's city population was less suited than its peasant class to provide an economic basis for national unity, in part because of the large proportion of Jewish population in cities. As historian Lloyd Gartner notes, all Polish political parties in the post-war republic preferred a Polish national state, even though a third of the country's population, including more than two and a half million Jews in 1921, were members of a national or religious minority, making Poland the chief target of post-war demands for national minority rights. Polish chauvinists resisted these demands in a series of pogroms and attacks that the new government failed to halt, signal that full Jewish equality in the Polish state was deemed unacceptable, much less minority rights. Uh, those are Lloyd Gardner's words. Uh, I should mention here that there was uh, actually a, a Jewish kehila in post-war Poland, a Jewish governing body, uh, but it was not allowed to run autonomously. Uh, my understanding is that the Polish government uh, intervened in elections in that body and controlled its budget. In contrast, insofar as the social reorganization of immigrants in the United States promoted their participation in American life, it could be equated with assimilation. But what did assimilation mean here? A careful reading of old world traits suggests that its authors did not primarily conceive assimilation as a means of preserving an existing Anglo-Saxon culture or promoting conformity to it, but rather as a means for organizing a democratic public pressing need that the pragmatist philosopher John Dewey would explore more fully in his 1927 book, The Public and Its Problems. Thomas Park and Miller assumed that some social transactions had consequences for individuals who were not directly engaged in them. The public, comprised of all those who were so affected, organized itself to understand and deal with those consequences that were important enough to need social control. They, and later Dewey, argued that the vast expansion of interdependence in modern societies multiplied and magnified such consequences, making the organization of the new and expanded public urgently necessary. The locomotive, the, the post, the telegraph, the press dissolved to distances, they wrote, so that the conditions of individuals' daily living were vitally affected by events occurring without their knowledge thousands of miles away thus depriving them of control over the system of relationships in which they found themselves. Immigration was one aspect of the larger problem of organizing a democratic public under these new conditions. No public was possible without the capacity for mutual understanding, and mutual understanding in turn required a body of common memories. This is particularly true in a democracy, they wrote, where it is intended that the public institution should be responsive to public opinion. There can be no public opinion unless the persons who compose the public are able to live and think in the same world. To this end, immigrants had to learn the language of the country and the history of the people among whom they had chosen to dwell, just as native-born Americans had to familiarize themselves with the history and social life of the countries from which the immigrants come. Because the purpose of this assimilation was to make the immigrant a member of the public, and a democratic public requires active participation in collective problem solving through communication, assimilation could hardly be a passive experience. On the contrary, Thomas Park and Miller expected the immigrant to contribute to, as well as share, a fund of knowledge, experience, sentiments, and ideals common to the whole community. As Park put it a year later, it is participation rather than submission or conformity that makes Americans a foreign-born peoples. So to conclude, uh, what I've tried to suggest here is that nation building and civil incorporation of ethno-religious minorities, both in Poland and in America, were important background conditions for the creation of the social disorganization paradigm. 
The theoretical categories of primary group organization, social disorganization, and social reorganization were based in particular on the contrasting historical experiences of Poles and Jews as Thomas and Znanietzky understood them. Now, I hasten to add that my interpretation is not a story of American exceptionalism. The Polish peasants and old world traits transplanted articulated a perspective about immigrants that was not widely shared in the United States at the time of their publication. More typical were the coercive and conformist campaign to Americanize the immigrants during the First World War, and anti-Semitic and nativist demands for the drastic restriction of immigration that prevailed in 1921 and 1924. When Jews in Poland and elsewhere most needed refuge, those American restrictions remained firmly in place. Recovering the historical basis of the social disorganization paradigm reveals how folk knowledge and prejudices can inform theoretical categories. This is a good reason to critically assess the Polish peasant, but not, I think, to reject it. The book gives us hope that communities can be reconstructed along more expansive, democratic, and pluralistic lines. And that hope takes on renewed relevance today when immigration has again become a social flashpoint in both Europe and America.